So how can we avoid some of these errors, and what are these errors that, uh, that we frequently find with access? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, the best way to avoid errors that have to do with misalignment and, uh, in the worst case scenario, perforations, uh, is to really understand your pulp anatomy. If you understand the pulp anatomy, um, you will have a far better chance of finding uh, this three-dimensionally abstract space in the middle of the tooth that is hidden to the eye, and it can only get an impression of off of the x-ray mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is uh, most minimally invasive. So, you know that uh, perceptual ability test that you took uh, to enter into dental oh, school? Trump. That's where it comes <laughs> That's where it comes handy. The perceptual ability test is your ability to take, yeah. uh, you take it from a two-dimensional space of a radiograph and create something that you look at and you envision it, and then now you're almost like a bullseye trying to use, uh, you know, as a target to, uh, without removing too much dentin, to go ahead and find it. Right. The, the, the catch is that the space is really minuscule, and in some calcified cases, it could be really the width of a hair. Right. So we're, you know, you really are uh, searching for a needle in a haystack. But um, to that effect, taking multiple preoperative radiographs, uh, such as bite wing straight radiographs and side um, angled x-rays, yeah. will help you build this three-dimensional picture. Right. which is uh, otherwise uh, difficult to construct from a single periapical radiograph. Uh, also, now with the advent of CBCTs and so on, you can have a far better idea three-dimensionally yeah. yeah. of where things are. Of course, the dream would be to have a micro-CT of a tooth. Unfortunately, at the present time, the radiation would be too much to create a micro-CT of a live tooth. Uh, so, you know, that information still eludes us. Uh, but we get a fairly good impression using regular CBCTs. And that's where the digital radiographs as a whole come into um, play to be very helpful because you can do all kinds of measurements using the ruler and the, um, the gauge component of the digital interface so that you can uh, get far better, uh, more accurate readings about the distance from the top of the tooth to the floor of the chamber and even your uh, working length and so on. So you can have a better idea before you get started. It's all about estimates and then confirmation through uh, um, you know, getting in there and finding out what's going on. And, uh, you know, and sometimes when you're lost and you can't quite uh, find your way around, if you've been clamping that tooth with a rubber dam alone, it may not be a bad idea to uh, take the rubber dam and turn it into a split dam, do multiple teeth. The orientation of where you are in terms of one, the one tooth that you're accessing compared to the other teeth is very helpful because the x-ray will give you information about a couple of adjacent teeth. But when you, oftentimes when you do your endo access, you may isolate that single tooth. And if you are only isolating that single tooth, you're only looking at the crown, and you lose the perspective that gives you, you know, uh, axial alignment compared to adjacent teeth that you saw on the x-ray. Yeah. And that is the main reason why many people uh, end up perforating in the easiest of teeth, right? I mean, we were talking about premolar teeth being, a, you know, a prime candidate for perforations. The main reason is because these teeth are oftentimes very, um, you know, Deceiving, they look easy. You go straight for it, and you end up um, um, perforating. So um, that's uh, another thing. And one of the tricks for that would be to actually use a uh, um, your sealer. You know, I use the biceramic sealer, so it's very easy. BC sealer is very easy to apply to your uh, access preparation when you're kind of lost. You know, you've mm -hmm. gone down and you can't find the canal. And you're like, where am I? You, take, you inject a little bit of that material in there, and you take a, you take a bite wing radiograph of the tooth, and you see, you've seen an impression now of the shape of your preparation. And as you mentioned in, the, in our previous video, that sometimes you can actually get a little squiggly of the BC sealer going into the, right. into the canal. And what's great about this is that it comes off very easily because it's hydrous sealer hydrophilic. You just use your ultrasonic and water, yeah. and it washes out all the sealer immediately, so you don't end up having to have a mess on your hand now for the rest of the uh, procedure to deal with. So that's really uh, where it comes handy. And um, the biceramic line kind of obviously reminds me of then um, what we would use in cases of the dreaded uh, root perforation during the access uh, opening. Well, you know, perforations do occur, but we really have to keep in mind that they are procedural errors. Yes. Because, um, I mean, it's not something that should occur, and, and, and given all the information that you try to bring to the table when you're doing these procedures, um, when they do occur, it's really important to have uh, the mechanism to solve the problem at, at hand. Yes. So um, give, can you give me a little idea about how to handle that? I guess we're all humans, for better or worse, and everybody can make a mistake, and it could be a perforation. So when that perforation occurs, what is the best way to deal with it? 
First of all, I think it's best to repair it right away, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, most important. Yeah, so having good isolation if a perforation, because the perforation fails because of contamination, correct? Exactly. So you wanna make sure you have good isolation for the same reason a uh, pulp capping would uh, work best when you, it's done under a rubber dam and you have good isolation, it's a sterile um, kind of a pulp cap. The same thing with perforations. If you have a sterile perforation, it would actually have a fairly good prognosis if it's repaired uh, immediately and properly. And for that, we've, you know, we've had a godsend to, uh, <laughs> to, to us from, uh, from orthopedic medicine, which is basically this bioceramics that are now used in, uh, in endodontics. And originally MTA was the material that was used for perforation repairs, and it worked very nicely. But now we have a, an improvement on it, which is this bioceramic endosequence bioceramic putty, which is kind of like the same thing as MTA, except that it's so much easier to apply to the site. Doesn't require mixing, it's pre-mixed and it's fast set. So you can do it immediately and proceed to, um, to complete your work. Most importantly, uh, bioceramics are bioactive. Yeah. And bioactive is a very, very important consideration uh, as we look at the fact that we're now dealing with living tissue. So we're no longer, you know, looking at a, a, you know, at a material that just can be um, uh, placed without any consideration of its ability to interact and to provide the perfect environment for these, uh, you know, living cells. So um, this putty that you're talking about is in a Sanados syringe. I know that. Yeah. And uh, you know, it was uh, originally available in a jar, yeah. but it, because of the fact that uh, we want to deliver it uh, in very small quantities and we use yeah. very little of it, it became apparent that it was best delivered in a, in a form where we could take exactly the amount we wanted, no. no more, no less, just the exact amount you need, and place it into the uh, space that had been... Uh, Precisely, and, and what is that amount is basically the width of your perforation and then a little bit of flash around it so you right. can have a good seal. So for example, let's say you have a, uh, a situation in which you have a number two round bar perforation, you know, of that size, let's say, hopefully smaller. So hopefully it's just a pin perforation. You know, the smaller the perforation, obviously, the better the prognosis. Uh, as you can see here in this uh, diagram, you end up having a perforation that's in touch first with the PDL and then the bone underneath there. So you wanna make sure that you have have control of the hemorrhage in the area, so you clean, disinfect this, in the site. You control the hemorrhage. You may use uh, some, uh, you know, uh, hemostatic agents and so on. But oftentimes, if if you get there quickly enough, it's still, and you don't manipulate the area too much and mistakenly continue to work and you know pump hypochlorite in there, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is even the worst. Um, then you have a good chance that the area would be dry enough uh, that you can then place a little bit of a ball of this pipe material. So the idea is that you close the uh, the space by putting a little bit of this putty material right on top of the um, uh, inside the perforation and now you have an interface uh, area that it, you know the material sits in 20 minutes. I'm usually I don't want to wait that long so what I generally do is I put a liner right on top of that and the liner should be a compatible liner so it has to be at this point should be a, a bioactive kind of a, a liner it could be glass ionomer or a biceramic based liner, and uh, then uh, light cure it, so then I'm ready to go. Restore. So just repair it, and uh, you know, the surface is dry, and I can go ahead and uh, now find the canal or proceed to do what I need to do without having the fear of this stuff washing out. So if a perforation were to occur before you had actually instrumented the canals fully mm -hmm. and gone about your root canal therapy, you're saying let's repair it and then yes. continue the root canal continue procedure. to work. And that's a huge difference. You know, when, we had, when MTA and all these other stuff came out, it was great because you could repair it, but then you had to make a second appointment. Exactly. You couldn't do it at the same time exactly. because the stuff would wash out. That's exactly. If you, had, you couldn't do your typical irrigation during you know, your uh, repair of the perforation. So MTA, which would require essentially uh, the second appointment because you would place a cotton pellet with moisture. Yes. Because these uh, bioceramic materials, whether it be MTA or some others that were not pre-mixed, required a much longer time for setting. Yes. And required moisture. Yes. Which all of them do. So what, what we're really saying here is, is that we have a fast set putty that you can place, yeah. cover, 
and move the record. And proceed. And proceed. Yeah, so literally, it would just frankly, it would take you as long as you know, your assistant can give you the putty, and then you can put the liner on top exactly. of it. Exactly. Literally like your, two minutes. It's a two-minute, uh, basically, hang. But uh, again, that should not be a license to say, okay, now I can just oh. go ahead and you know find a canal. No. Remember, if you have calcified canals that you can't find, the, the key thing is to not get too zealous. You have to send those urinodontists with the microscope. They will have a better chance of finding it. That's the way you can avoid procedural errors, such as these perforations, because again, as we talked about, perforations are avoidable. You just don't have to proceed to do the case. You can always refer out, and that's basically what we would recommend. Uh, and after you put the liner on there, then you place your cord that bonds to the liner, and you're good to go with that case. I might make a mention that it, 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 it's not uncommon uh, in a, a group practice of endodontists mm -hmm. for uh, my partner to refer a case to me that he can't find the canals or for me to right. refer it to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, of course. It happens. Cases I mean, that are very it, difficult. It, sometimes it yeah. just takes another pair of eyes to, to, to see something or another You're day. You're absolutely right. Sometimes just another day. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So this is basically the uh, uh, the Sani Do's uh, uh, putty material that is used. This is the endosequence RRM putty fast set, 20 minutes to set, and it's fairly uh, easy to use and apply. And you can see here, all you need to do is have a spatula. You you can uh, take out a little small portion of it at Sani Dose and uh, use your sterile little spatula, take a little dose, and that just gets uh, put on. And you can actually get a whole bunch of uh, uh, doses of the putty right out of this, it's like at least 10, depending on the size of your applications that you're using. So um, that's basically what I would uh, recommend to use. So. We have talked about access up until now. We hopefully have mastered it, and we know in case somebody screws up, then what's the way to go ahead and uh, address the uh, uh, a perforation, how to avoid perforations to begin with, but then how also to repair them. Now let's talk about the second component here, emergency treatment. We have a busy uh, schedule already. Patient calls you in a lot of pain. You have to see them. It's an emergency treatment. How do we go about it? How do we handle it? The reason why I love, have always loved emergency treatments is, is there's no better opportunity to create a missionary in your practice than to take a patient who comes in pain and have them leave. Get him out of pain. pain. That's terrific. So That's it's a well real big practice builder. That absolutely is So doing is it right. well and doing it right the first time, it's a real one. All right. So let's come back and talk about it.